Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started on day two. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Micah Fisher. I'm one of the other uh, co-chairs of this conference. Uh, today, the first session is going to be devoted mostly to infectious disease issues. Our first speaker is Dr. Jay Varkey. He is an assistant professor of infectious disease here at Emory University Hospital. He was involved in the management of the Ebola patients that came through our hospital. and is also the director of our antibiotic stewardship program here at Emory University Hospital as well. He'll be speaking to us about a look back at Ebola, MERS, and SARS. Thank you, Micah, and good morning. Um, pleasure to be here this morning. So I'm going to do my best and do kind of a whirlwind tour through what I would consider three infectious diseases crises. So Ebola, which obviously has sort of dominated the news over the last year, but ironically is actually not a new infectious disease compared to two others which were. And in some sense, I, I think there were some important lessons there that I think um, have some lessons uh, in terms of how we manage Ebola. So we'll start off with SARS. So uh, looking back at SARS, I think, it, I think it's important to realize that it wasn't really that long ago. Um, in fact, if you had to start a date, I think there's some lessons there to begin with. So the first uh, case, as far as we know, with SARS um, would have been mid-November of 2002. And this was a cluster, um, the index patient likely was, was a farmer in uh, Foshan City in Guangdong Province, China which is on the far southeast coast of China near Hong Kong. And when I say cluster, part of the challenge there was is that there were likely several persons with atypical pneumonia that unfortunately public health officials only found out about worldwide several months later. So there was a gap, and I would argue that looking back, this was a critical gap where there was an opportunity to possibly to contain this outbreak. Um, but unfortunately, the first, the first notion of something happening would have been around the second week of February. And this is when public health officials in China uh, reported this to the WHO. The WHO, understandably, was concerned about um, a novel influenza strain, whether there was H5N1, um, sent investigators in. And interestingly, that seemed to be the calm right before the storm. The story really picks up uh, on February 21st, when there was a 64-year-old physician, we'll call him patient A, uh, from Guangdong province, who arrived in Hong Kong to attend a wedding. And he checked in to uh, the ninth floor of the Metropole Hotel, room 911. Uh, and one day later, uh, was admitted into an ICU with respiratory failure at a Hong Kong hospital. Now the key point there is, is that when he arrived at the hotel, he unfortunately had had five days of respiratory Interestingly enough, the day he arrived, he actually felt well enough to go shopping with his brother for this wedding. But then later that night fell, felt unwell. And uh, when he was admitted, he told the hospital officials in Hong Kong that he had been caring as an academic physician for several patients with atypical pneumonia in Guangdong province, but insisted that his symptoms were um, This patient subsequently died on March 4th. If you look here, this is actually a schematic or layout of the ninth floor of the Metropole Hotel. So why do I show this? You look in the green room, um, room K, this is actually the room where this index patient stayed. If you look at all the other rooms that are indicated in blue, those are occupants who subsequently developed secondary SARS. Um, and in all, there were 20 persons who actually were on the floor um, during that short period of time where this individual was there who became sick with it. If you look at the red ovals, this was actually areas where when they investigated this hotel to try and understand why there was such an incredible burden of secondary transmission on this floor, where they had actually uh, done environmental surveillance cultures and actually identified molecular evidence on multiplex PCR of SARS coronavirus, mostly on the carpet in front of the room and in two of the rooms actually on the doorway. So from an epidemiologic standpoint, it was thought to be that the area of transmission wasn't in the patient room, but was actually in the common corridors or possibly in the elevator bay, which you see in the middle, where it's tall. But that's not really the key point on here. It's, it's an interesting story, but I think this next slide, which I realize is messy, might not be easy to see in the back of the room. But this is really tells you the impact of what can happen in a tightly connected global society. So if you look at um, patient A in black, that's our index patient who arrived from Guangdong province, was treated in Hong Kong hospital, had two family members who subsequently became 
sick and had four healthcare workers that cared for him who also became sick as a, as a result of this. If you look at uh, patient B, uh, patient B actually was, um, call him Mr. JC, uh, stayed in room 908. Uh, he actually was traveled to Hanoi in Vietnam, where subsequently he actually was admitted and ended up resulting in the secondary transmission of over 40 uh, healthcare workers. Some of the numbers on here are a little bit dated. If you look at patients C, D, and E, those are actually three women from Singapore who stayed in two rooms, also on the ninth floor, who traveled back to Singapore. Ironically, even though all three of them had um, SARS, only one was actually thought to be uh, uh, infectious enough to cause secondary transmission. Unfortunately, that individual alone was actually responsible for causing over 195 infections among the 250 uh, persons in Singapore who developed some. If you look beyond that room, uh, sorry, patient F was a 78-year-old woman from Canada who returned back to Toronto and unfortunately was sick upon arrival. She had four family members who got sick and several healthcare workers as well. The last person I think is just the most amazing story is, is actually patient J. So patient J didn't even stay at the Metropole Hotel. Um, he was a 26-year-old airport worker who happened to visit the ninth floor to visit a friend of his, passed past room 911, visited his friend who was asymptomatic, but subsequently became sick. He ended up getting admitted to a Hong Kong hospital. Unfortunately, that information wasn't found until March. By that point, actually had resulted in the secondary transmission of over 100 uh, persons, mostly healthcare workers. This was SARS. So imagine this with Ebola happening all within the ninth floor. It didn't happen, but just amazing lessons. And um, I'd encourage those of you who haven't seen it, the WHO has a publicly available write-up, and, and I think it's titled, How the World Beat SARS. It's an amazing read, just from the stories itself, in terms of understanding the stories about the flights, in terms of investigating this. People actually took off from various points of, uh, uh, from Hong Kong. Absolutely amazing. So in all, uh, SARS result was actually identified in over 29 countries. Over 8,000 people were identified as having cases and uh, nearly 800 deaths. The, the uh, etiology from an infectious disease standpoint was thought to be, it actually was found to be a novel coronavirus that was deemed SARS-CoV. Uh, and there's been a lot of hypothesis about whether there's an animal reservoir, which is also a common theme with all the infections we're talking about this morning. Um, the little critter picture there is a civet, a uh, masked civet, sort of a, a, um, a endemic animal in the, in the area. Um, there's also a raccoon dog that's been found to be colonized with a, with a coronavirus that bears uh, very similar genetic similarities to the strains that were found in. But the key clinical features here is an incubation period of about two to ten days. On average, um, the incubation period, most people got sick about four to seven days after exposure. And again, as a common theme, the initial symptoms are nonspecific. So fever, headache, um, you, and they usually developed into a dry cough and dyspnea. One of the key things was that uh, by day seven or by day 10, nearly all patients have uh, radiographic evidence of pneumonia. So about 10 years after the first patient with uh, SARS was identified, there was a 60-year-old man in, who was admitted to a hospital in Saudi Arabia with a seven-day history of fever, cough, and dyspnea. And a day later, was transferred to the ICU for a respiratory failure. Ten days later, he died of multi-organ failure. And actually, those uh, images, the x-ray and the CT, are from this index patient. Uh, this is the first patient that was found to be identified with what we now call the Midwestern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. Um, and then the important thing is just rec recognizing the epidemiology of it, because there's actually still secondary, uh, sorry, uh, cases, travel-related cases that are being identified today. But the main endemic areas with cases include the Arabian Peninsula. So this includes Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Qatar, Oman, Jordan, Kuwait, Yemen, Lebanon, and Iran. Uh, but there have been travel-associated cases, including one that was just reported, I think, within the last 10 days, uh, in Germany as well as in the Netherlands. So, so far, to the best that we can tell, there have been over 1,000 uh, laboratory-confirmed cases and nearly 400 deaths. Etiology, again, is a novel coronavirus that actually bears a lot of genetic similarities to the virus that caused SARS. Um, again, 
An animal reservoir has been hypothesized. In fact, actually, um, this dromedary single hump camel has actually been found to be uh, the cause of human-related cases. But there have also been cases, uh, human cases, where, where an animal association has not been uh, found. The incubation period is anywhere from 2 to 14 days with a median uh, time of 5 days after exposure to developing symptoms. And again, symptoms are somewhat nonspecific, starting off with fever, chills, often with rigors, uh, headache, cough that progresses to a pneumonia. That pneumonia thus progresses to acute respiratory failure, often with ARDS, um, and results in multi-organ failure. So that's just his background. Um, the couple of points I wanted to make about Ebola. One was simply the scale. Um, and again, it's worth, I've given several talks about Ebola since, I'm sure David has as well, since last fall. Um, and one of the saddest things is having to update this slide every few weeks, because the numbers keep getting worse. Um, but as of most recently, these are WHO numbers and are probably still an underestimate of the true burden of disease. There have been over 25,000 cases of Ebola uh, so far, with, the, with much, much of the burden, most of the burden being in uh, three countries of West Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, and over 10,000 deaths. And to give an idea of how bad this scale is compared to previous Ebola outbreaks, it's important to recognize that Ebola was first identified back in 1976. But since then, there have been nearly annual outbreaks, but usually in small, isolated villages. The biggest one up until this point resulted in the, in the deaths of around 300 person. So really, this is just on orders of magnitude worse than any other previous Ebola outbreak that's been identified. And then just as background, so um, Ebola virus, unlike the other two viruses, are actually come from a family known as the Filoviridae. And there's, there's two genre of viruses. One is Ebola virus, and there's its somewhat similar cousin, uh, Marburg. Um, these are enveloped RNA viruses, uh, and uh, it gets its name from a Filoviridae from its shape. You guys have seen this very characteristic picture that actually comes from our CDC colleagues. It takes many forms. It can take this sort of filamentous, ribbon-like shape. It can sometimes be in the shape of a number six. Um, and there's five subtypes that we recognize. For the purpose of just the rest of this talk, we'll be referring to the Zaire subtype, which bears the, the most homology, the most similarity to the current strain that's actually decimating so much of West Africa. And again, as, as most of you know, there are no vaccines or treatment that are currently approved for humans, so there are several candidates for both uh, treatments and vaccines. And case fatality uh, rates are awful, um, as, and depending on the outbreak you look at, have ranged anywhere from around 40 to 90. So, so why Emory? Why am I here? Um, so do, for, I know many of you are from campus, but for those of you who are in the Atlanta area, haven't spent time on campus, just to orient you, this is Woodruff Circle. Um, it, this is what it generally looks like on an average morning at Emory. It's quiet, you can, it's a drop off area where you can have commuters can drop off loved ones. There's commuter buses. On the left of them is the medical school. On the right is Emory University Hospital. Um, the road that you're facing is Clifton Road, so just a couple blocks north is exactly where we are here at the Emory Conference Center. This is a general snapshot of what things look like on, on July 30th. So what happened on that day? Well, everything changed. So Emory University Hospital was asked slash told to uh, receive the first patients with confirmed Ebola virus disease to be treated in the United States. And uh, our first two patients who, somewhat to their chagrin, have kind of become somewhat celebrities are patient one was a 33-year-old male physician. Patient two was a 59-year-old uh, female medical missionary, both of whom are working in an, Ebola, an Ebola treatment center in Monrovia, Liberia. Um, when we were first notified the arrival time, it, Exact arrival time wasn't really clear, but we were told to be ready within 72 hours. 72 hours, a lot of things had changed. Um, so this is still Woodruff Circle, but you can see now just dominated by news trucks. For those of you who were here, you might have some degree of post-traumatic stress from what things were like on campus during that time. I would draw your attention to that blue tent you can sort of see on the right side. Um, that's a close-up. This kind of became, I can say this now since several months down the road, became colloquially known as Camp Ebola. Um, this was a group of reporters that actually spent 24-7 of their time there in August in Atlanta. Um, they, I don't know how they managed to stay well hydrated, but they, they were there all the time. Occasionally they had times to come indoors in which there was a separate spot for them um, in, the, uh, in the annex building south of Emory University Hospital um, where there were ongoing press briefings. 
And again, these news trucks went all the way up Clifton Road right to where we are right now. Now, the news trucks are gone now, um, which I think makes it great for a setting like this, like the Critical Care Summit, to really talk about some of the objective lessons. So a couple points I just want to highlight it, um, in summary. Uh, first is, again, the symptomatology. As a lot of us have become aware, the initial symptoms of Ebola are not specific. They resemble a lot of other febrile illnesses. One point I'd like to highlight is the role of gastroenteritis, which is almost universally present around day six of persons with Ebola. The gastroenteritis, which has been reported in previous outbreaks with this current strain, is absolutely profound and can actually resemble cholera-like levels of diarrhea, where patients can lose up to five, 10 liters of fluids a day. Um, the other point I would want to highlight, again, especially to our critical care audience, is this idea of small vessel involvement. Based on probably with this huge cytokine storm, this incredible ramp up of, of the immune system to the virus, there's an incredible amount of capillary leak in these patients, where although you're losing a tremendous amount of fluids, the more you replenish, the more you can actually third space and leak. So more to come on that when you talk about some of the complications uh, with aggressive supportive care. And despite the old moniker of of hemorrhagic fever or Ebola hemorrhagic fever, uh, gross hemorrhage is actually somewhat unusual. So bleeding is actually usually only, or gross bleeding is usually only present in about 30% of the cases in this outbreak. So most people end up dying, again, of multi-organ failure. So clinical care. Again, just to reiterate the point, there are no proven therapeutics. That being said, it would be inappropriate not to, again, thank a lot of our colleagues, including those at the CDC, the FDA, uh, and then medical and scientific colleagues, including those on the ground in West Africa, uh, those in Europe who also took care of medically evacuated patients for their collaboration in caring for what ended up being the four patients who cared for it ever. The treatment, again, which is well recognized in this critical care audience, is supportive care. Um, the CDC, I think, did a great job to try and define this with, and said, I mean, again, IV fluids, balancing electrolytes, um, monitoring vital signs. I, it was amazing to me to, to try and realize how challenging this is to communicate media in terms of how supportive care can actually save lives. Um, what I would argue is that a practical definition of supportive care is just simply keeping a patient alive long enough for their own intrinsic immune system to develop the antibodies necessary to clear their viremia. And we have proof of this because we have labs and because we had our colleagues at the CDC to process our lab. So the more you're able to keep somebody alive, they developed detectable antibodies to Ebola virus, IgM, IgG. With that, their viral load came down daily. That correlated very nicely with clinical improvement. Academically, it was very satisfying. Um, two other points I want to highlight with this idea of supportive care. One is this idea on the impact of electrolytes. Again, to this audience, it's no surprise to patients who have this degree of gastroenteritis that there are profound electrolyte abnormalities. Um, all of our patients required aggressive supplementation, especially of potassium which again highlights on how important it was to have a safe way to check labs. Our first patient, who was a physician, who was the medical director of the Ebola treatment unit in Monrovia, arrived to Emory Hospital on day 11 of his illness without a single CBC, without a single metabolic panel. His first set of labs occurred at Emory University Hospital. Now that has changed, but that is the state of play of what most Ebola treatment centers were looking like in West Africa in July of last year. I'm gonna skip this for time's sake, but again, we wrote up our experience, and this was a nice paper that uh, my colleague Marshall Lyon uh, took the lead on in, in writing up on, on describing some of the electrolyte abnormalities of our first two patients. But the other point I just want to highlight is, again, when you think about supportive care, it comes down to critical care nurses. Um, and again, one of the differences we had at Emory was the ability to provide 24-7 bedside nursing care. Now, again, for those of you who have provided care overseas, you'll realize that the state of play in Ebola, for an most Ebola treatment centers in West Africa last year, last summer, was usually an open ward of 80-some mattresses of critically ill patients with two or three physicians, two or three nurses. You take that, you compare it to having two patients, five physicians, 21 nurses. Those are the ratios we had at, at Emory, and those are the advantages. Um, the last point I want to highlight is this role of mechanical ventilation and dialysis. The conventional wisdom as of last summer was that if you had a patient with Ebola that was sick enough to require mechanical ventilation or dialysis, that those interventions may not be wise 
because those, the outcomes of those patients were inevitable, that those patients would inevitably die. Our third patient uh, developed respiratory failure, actually the first night I took care of him. He got intubated, was on mechanical ventilation for 12 days, developed renal failure, and ended up on dialysis for 24 days. He was able to be discharged home on hospital day 40. I realized as an evidence-based audience, we're not supposed to make clinical decisions based on an N of 1. But I had dinner with this patient four weeks ago. He's giving a talk at Johns Hopkins today. He's spoken to many of you at different critical care conferences. Um, I would argue that aggressive interventions like this are part of the supportive care that can make a difference in clinical outcomes for patients with Ebola. So just in summary, I, I think the key lessons in terms of all three of these diseases is the importance of early patient isolation and contact tracing. These diseases are controllable. Like any other outbreak of Ebola, this current outbreak will be contained. There are early signs that things are getting better, especially in Liberia, somewhat in Sierra Leone, less so in Guinea. But with this sort of bread and butter uh, uh, means of controlling infections, this outbreak will also be contained. The other is, and again, Dr. Kuhar will talk about this, the key idea of containing this is actually nothing novel. These are basic infection control measures. The key, though, is strict adherence to these infection control measures. Um, this actually extends into the, into the laboratory uh, to recognizing the fact that these are highly, highly infectious uh, viruses. And again, recognize the fact that supportive care improves survival. And I would argue that I'm sure many of you have been involved with sort of preparation efforts at your respective hospitals. A lot of, there's been a lot of mention about the fact that Emory has this biocontainment unit I would say that we use this because it was advantageous because we had it. Biocontainment units are not necessarily needed to control Ebola. Um, but I do think that they do provide an advantage for other emerging infections that might be more contagious, including emerging. So with that, I'll stop. Um, just very quickly, with a lot of people to thank, I do want to highlight my colleagues in infectious diseases. A lot of familiar faces, probably including folks in the crowd here in Emory Critical Care. And lastly, to our patients. Again, it's a credit that all of our patients not only were caring for patients with Ebola, uh, but though them, they all themselves had patients who died of Ebola. Um, as part of that, all four have actually uh, volunteered to uh, participate with us, not just as patients, but now as colleagues. And some of the research studies we're actually doing and some of the follow-up care for, um, for their care following their illness. So for that, we're uh, very thankful. Thank you.